I think an important way to understand this problem of body fascism is to trace it back to its origins in what Morris Berman calls confiscation. Confiscation is what happens when you no longer identify with your body as it's lived and felt and directly experienced, and you come to imagine your body and experience your body in terms of how you think it looks to others. That is, others' views of you become part of your experience to such a degree that you take that to be the true experience of your body. Some of this can be seen in contemporary communication studies when you bring up the word or the concept nonverbal communication. See, traditionally, at least in history, when you'd use the word nonverbal communication, people would think a whole bunch of words that today hardly even make sense. They would think words like haptic or somatic or kinesthetic. Haptic means how something feels when you actually actually touch it or handle it. There's a haptic sort of communication you can, you know, it's everything from reading braille to actually being able to sense different textures as you touch them. Kinesthetic, you know, kinesthetic is if you close your hand, if you close your eyes and somebody puts different weighted objects in your hands, you can tell you can have a, a physical registry in your hands uh, when I'm juggling. Uh, there's lots of kinesthetic experiences that are part of that. Um, somatic, yes, somatic. Again, soma, re referring to the body, that our bodily experience, everything from indigestion to just the feeling of one's body, the visceral sense of it, uh, feeling senses of resistance and pressure. The body itself is experienced in such a richness, non-verbally, and yet it's come to mean visual. It's come to mean, when we say non-verbal today, young people in particular, they think visual when they hear non-verbal. They don't think haptic, somatic, or kinesthetic, which I think this is part of the issue. And as Berman points out, this, you know, it goes back all the way to ancient cultures. I mean, we can trace it back to Greece, at least as far as we want to go to the narcissist myth and people falling in love with their own image. But the difference is the critical role that mirrors have played in history. Mirrors and the wide distribution of polished surfaces coupled with electric lighting. I mean, electric lighting is very essential to bring out the high intensity of both one's look and then coupled with a mirror, electric light and mirror have unleashed an unprecedented scale of confiscation. Right now many people are alienated because they're chasing around an image that they can never have, that is the image of what other people see. And I think there was a time where, you know, after the mirror came around, right, again, and the, the distribution of the mirror and the wonderful, wonderful stuff to be read, uh, Oh, What a Blow That Phantom Gave Me is a very interesting book by an anthropologist. Uh, this is actually Michael Wesh, if people know who Mike Wesh is on YouTube. It was his professor, um, who was also a colleague of Marsha McLuhan's, and what he did, you know, he, he was one of these few people who had the capacity or had the great fortune of taking some of these technologies like mirrors, tape recorders, into holy, oral, what people would call primitive societies. And the experience was amazing to watch people transform themselves and their own psychology by way of the mirror. That the mirror suddenly gave one's own face to oneself. Whereas in, you know, again, most oral societies, other people decorate your face. Your face is not your problem. It's other people's, you know, they, they deal with it. Post-mirror, post-electricity, one becomes more and more confiscated, more and more alienated as we learn to try to appropriate ourselves for the gaze of the other. Modern conveniences like, um, 
washing machines. I mean, it's, it's part of the proliferation of clean clothing that has done this. But then with a vengeance has come strategic body manipulation through various forms of plastic surgery. Once you bring in the element of not just, you know, rituals of scarification that others do to imprint your body on the outside, but actual physical manipulations that are done, everything from rib removals to make one's waist smaller, uh, to neck extensions that are uh, done by, I guess, various forms, uh, to actually go in and carve out the structure. I mean, I think we can all see that in some way it may be, you know, the, the Michael Jackson phenomena that could be a predictor of what's to come that is plastic surgery addiction may be one of the most serious addictions that will face the 21st century. I think if Benoit Mandelbrot is right, and I think people are familiar with Mandelbrot and his work on self-similarity. I once saw him and he was sitting there with a head of cauliflower and he was talking about how the head of cauliflower, if you break off a little piece of the cauliflower, the little piece is self-similar to the whole. And he was trying to clarify this notion in chaos theory. It's funny to think that Hollywood with all of its vanity and its narcissism and its image consciousness and people just completely worried about how they look is now infecting the population wholesale through YouTube. YouTube has become a kind of microcosm of Hollywood culture where I think soon enough the same kinds of symptoms of neurosis, of preoccupation with image and self will be throughout the entire culture in the way that it began, I think we used to think, just in Hollywood. Uh, this question of body fascism, I think, is a wonderful question. I appreciate the videos. Okay, thanks.